Okay, um, I did say that uh, I'm Carolyn Peterson and I work here at the Washington State Library. My colleague Jennifer Fenton has just got back from ALA and is homesick, she, she just, so she won't be joining us today. But I did mention that we have technical support uh, in the form of Jeremy Stroud and Joe Oliver. Uh, please take down their, their information and contact them either way if somehow Blackboard um, throws you a loop. We have discovered since they upgraded last time that uh, there was a few technical issues where we haven't had them for quite some time. So we're delighted you're all here and uh, glad that you are interested in finding ways to save your library money. We are, uh, we wanted to acknowledge that we are part of the Secretary of State's office and that our program in particular is uh, funded by the Institute, a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. That is why we're able to bring you a continuing education program. We go out and look for programs of interest um, at a variety of places and then we ask these individuals to share their knowledge with us um, and with you. So that's something that we really enjoy. So then um, we also have reporting requirements from the state. And so at this point in time, we would ask that you would use the chat box way down at the bottom left-hand corner and please type in the name and the library organization that you represent. So if you are joining us, I understand someone from um, Australia is joining us. She's, that person is up way in the middle of the night to hear this presentation. So if you would just type in your name and your library name or your library organization. If you're a library student, if you're, you know, um, someone looking for a job, a librarian, or just, you know, you work for so and so library, we'd really appreciate it. And if you would do that right now, we'd like everybody, um, our, our Office of Financial Management asks us to track these for the presentations we do. So we'll give everybody a chance to do that, to say where they're from, I'm typing away. See, it takes a while. It's, it kind of always amazes me how, how fast information comes across from all parts of the uh, United States and abroad and things like that. The Internet does indeed unite us. So if you haven't typed it in, please do so. Okay, great. I see that most people have folks from all over the nation here today. And that's great. So, um, with no further ado, I am going to ask you to continue typing your name. If you haven't done so, please type your name and um, where you're from. And then I am now going to turn the mic over to Travis. And Travis is the technology specialist at one of our standalone municipal libraries. He works for the Liberty Lake Municipal Library and has done so for the last three years. And he has an educational background in computer science. And Travis understood early on that library budgets need to stretch as far as possible. So he developed this presentation as a way to share the ways that he has found to save his library money. So um, with no further ado, Travis, I'll turn the mic over to you. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I guess we can get started. Uh, as she said, my name is Travis Montgomery. Um, Pretty, pretty boring guy. Um, we'll uh, kind of just jump right into it. If you guys have any questions, just uh, feel free to uh, pop in and um, I can also answer some at the end. Um, I'm kind of a fast talker, so if anything needs to be repeated, just let me know. Um, without further ado, uh, here we go. Um, 10 technologies that will make uh, library life easier. Um, we'll just start uh, with the first. Um, this is something that's uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm a big preventative maintenance fan. Um, uh, the big thing that kills computers is heat. As you can see from the, uh, the top left picture, computers get dirty inside. Um, over time, they'll collect dust, debris um, through their system fans. Uh, this in turn causes them to run hotter. Um, if you don't, uh, you don't need a computer science degree to perform simple computer maintenance. Just common sense, safety, and patience. Um, a big, uh, big uh, um, advantage is just to buy yourself a couple cans of compressed air. Um, and then occasionally, if you don't have an IT person or, or something that does it, um, it's really quite simple. You just need to take a couple of screws off the case. Um, first things first, always make sure your computer is turned off and unplugged. Um, please don't electrocute yourself. Uh, I, somehow I'd be, I'll be at fault, and I don't think I'd like that. Um, so uh, um, just open up the case, take a can of compressed air, um, blow out the fans, um, 
just it, you, you can visually see if a computer is is dirty. Um, if it is, just just clean it out. Um, they also have uh, um, uh, vacuum cleaners and things that you can do to clean out a case. Um, a lot of computers have. Uh, um, uh, on them. If you have like an all-in-one, you can't exactly take them apart very easily. Again, um, the easiest way is probably to just unplug the thing, take it outside so you don't make a big mess in your office, and uh, clean it out that way. Um, pretty straightforward on most of it, um, but this something that takes very little time is, and cans of compressed air are not terribly expensive, can um, immeasurably increase the life expectancy of a computer. Um, so. Um, unless anybody has any questions, I'll move on to my next slide. Um, another thing, again, preventative maintenance, printer maintenance. Every printer or every library I know of has has printers, and uh, most people don't realize that they need preventative maintenance as well. Um, printer jams, I'm sure everybody's run into them. If they haven't, it's coming. Trust me, you'll run into this issue. Um, again, you don't have to have a computer science degree or an electronics repair degree to work on a printer. Um, big thing is um, just just taking taking your time, making sure again it's unplugged um, and uh, doing it the right way. Um, different printers, if you have a laser printer, they're going to be definitely more entailed on on cleaning and things like that. Um, always, uh, yeah, printers are definitely always a challenge. Um, but if if you're smart about it, there you can save a lot of money. Um, we actually in my library we used to have a uh, um, a licensing agreement or excuse me a repair agreement with a company that was costing us I think it was about 150 bucks every single month, and then we had to pay them for every print that we did, um, which just for us was ridiculous there. So I actually took over um, the maintenance and repair of our our big. $10,000 laser printer, um, which has saved us quite a bit of money, but um, lesson learned, don't do that. Um, uh, working on big laser printers is ridiculously difficult, um, so let my uh, lesson um, be uh, yours. Uh, definitely it's worth it's worth the money to have somebody take care of it for you. Okay. Uh, but on a uh, Travis, just a, a quick question. Someone has said sure. I wanted to bring it to your attention. Someone has said I've never heard. You finished talking about why you don't you don't think laser printers are good, but then ask figure out how much. What is a rubber rejuvenator? Make sure you address that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, just to just to, to um, uh, uh, come come full circle. If you have a big um, copier laser printer that you're, you have a maintenance contract agreement, go ahead and, and stick with that. Uh, um, uh, this is one thing that I've taken on myself, and it's extremely difficult. So um, this, um, I, just to kind of elaborate, this maintenance is more just for your cheapie that you buy or your basic laser printer. Don't do this for your your you know, ten thousand, twenty thousand dollar massive copier printer scanner. Um, let the professionals do that because it's exceedingly difficult. But um, going to the rubber rejuvenator, um, you can buy cans of this. Um, the easiest place most uh, most libraries have an Amazon account. Um, just type in rubber rejuvenator. It comes in a can. Um, it's just it looks kind of like a can of spray paint, and uh, um, it's got a you know. A, a, a smell of uh, that it's got like alcohol or whatever in it. It's flammable, I believe. Um, the advantage of rubber rejuvenator is you put you spray it some of it on like a cloth. Um, don't use uh, um, try to use like a microfiber cloth or something that's not going to leave particles. Everything that you you do on rollers is it, it needs to be completely clean. So um, just like if you clean a monitor. Always use like a microfiber cloth so it doesn't leave any residue afterwards. So <clears throat> the big advantage of rubber rejuvenator is um, every laser printer and inkjet printer uses rollers to make the paper run through. Most of the time when you have paper jams, it's due to roller issues, be it particles on the roller, be it rollers that are getting old and cracked. Um, a lot of times you'll find out that if you if you take the thing open it up and look at them you'll see the rollers they'll have residue be it dust paper dust um, 
uh, leftover ink or leftover toner on the things. Cleaning those things and keeping the rubber in, in, in a soft um, uh, format will actually make a huge difference on your printer. Um, that's the biggest cause of paper jams that I've ever found, other than you know people putting in the wrong size paper or what have you. So rubber rejuvenator just essentially cleans the rubber and it keeps it from becoming hard and cracked. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I was just trying to read the notes here, trying to. Um, how often are you, should you do this? Should you do this once a month, once a week? What type of, of, of uh, specificity? Rubber rejuvenator does not have to be done um, all that often, maybe two or three times a year. Um, you'll find that um, most libraries, if they don't have somebody that's doing this, they've never been done on it. Um, you can have a laser printer, you know, last you 10 years, and people will never do things like this. Um, it's one of those things, um, first things first, just Open the thing up, use your can of compressed air, blow the thing out, and then take a look at the rubber. If it looks like it's, you know, old and cracked and, uh, and dirty, try this. Um, it's rubber rejuvenator. You can get the can for well under $10. Um, and then, like I said, get yourself some microfiber cloth or something. And then what you're going to do is you're just going to um, put spray some of it on the cloth, rub it on, um, and then once you're through, you're actually going to clean off the, uh, the rollers, again, with a different cloth and maybe some um, uh, rubbing alcohol. Um, you don't want to leave this stuff on there because uh, uh, um, it will transfer to the paper, and you don't want an oily uh, substance on your paper after you print there. But uh, um, if you did this twice a year, you'd be, you'd be way ahead of just about everybody else that does things like this. And again, it's, it's just one of those things, just take your time, make sure it's unplugged, and uh, um, you can see the rollers, and most of the time you can just roll them with your finger, um, but uh, you'll find if you've got older printers, the rubber on these things gets old and cracks and can cause all kinds of issues there. Is there any further questions on that? Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Um, basic networking. Um, this right here, again, none of this stuff is uh, expert level by any means, um, but uh, things that you can do without spending a ton of money um, are things like um, installing a, a, a router, um, base filter. Um, probably a lot of people haven't heard of OpenDNS. Um, most libraries, um, by, um, by their mandates, have to have a content filter. Um, if you're not sure what a content filter is, that's what keeps things like pornography, violence, and, and uh, like drugs and things off of, off of uh, um, the Internet at libraries. Um, our library, um, when I first got here, had a, um, a hardware-based um, content filter that uh, um, cost us quite a bit of money, and we had to pay, I think, like $2,500 annual fee for it. Um, in doing some research, I found a site called OpenDNS, <coughs> wherein you don't have to have any hardware. Essentially, all you do is you set up an account and you, you pay them. I think we pay, I don't know, six or $900 a year. And um, what you do is you, you change all your DNS servers to, <coughs> excuse me, to OpenDNS, and it will do the complete content filter for wh whatever you want. Then you get a dashboard wherein you can set it up to block everything or block nothing. Um, if you know what a whitelist is, um, whitelist is, is certain websites that you allow, or you can do opposite, um, which is a blacklist, which is blocking out any kind of website. <clears throat> so the nice thing about this is you don't have to have any hardware, and the program, or excuse me, the, uh, the, the company, you just go to the, the dashboard and they do everything for you. It's quite simple, um, it's much cheaper, and there's less infrastructure, so that's a great way to save money. Um, wireless repeaters, um, um, a lot of uh, uh, libraries will have, uh, not necessarily dead, dead zones, but uh, areas where uh, reception is uh, mediocre at best. Um, you can buy wireless repeaters on, uh, on Newegg. If, you, if you've never heard of, of the site Newegg, um, it's just newegg.com. Um, if you're going to buy anything, computer or, or networking, um, I highly suggest them. They're based out of California. Uh, most of the time you can get cheap shipping and, uh, um, and uh, almost uh, most of the time it's free tax as, as long as you 
don't live in California. Um, but uh, um, a wireless repeater, um, they're quite easy to set up, and you can um, extend the, the range of your network for usually under $30 kind of thing. Um, if you're going to do things like um, like wireless networking, um, always make sure that you uh, encrypt your uh, your network um, if it's if it's work related. Um, if you're going to do a wireless network, um, make sure that uh, you have a password protection on it. Um, pretty pretty basic thing, but uh, um, you see people where their network is is unprotected and just about anybody can get in on it. Um, when your work computers are are attached to the same network. That's a, that's a horrible idea. So um, just make sure you, that you uh, you password protect your uh, network, and that's usually done at uh, at your router. Um, and uh, if you're not sure, that might be something that you have somebody uh, um, definitely take care of for you. Um, your uh, broadband carrier is um, another thing that uh, a lot of people don't think about um, for saving money. When I first got here, we had a, a company called Exo Communications. Um, which uh, offered us what's called a T1 line. Um, essentially, um, that's a one and a half meg speed up and down. Um, 15 years ago, that would have been really good, but uh, three years ago, that was horrible. Um, now your average internet is at least, say, 20 megs or 40 or 50 megs. Um, we were actually spending more, quite a bit more money per month for a 1.5 meg um, system than we pay for now a 30 meg system. So um, looking at simple things like your infrastructure, um, if you're in a really small town, it's a little bit tougher um, because uh, you're not going to have the, the choices that you do. Um, but uh, um, in, uh, um, in some larger markets and, and, and others, um, you know, just call around, check your different ISPs and see what's out there. Um, we were able to save more, you know, probably about 80 bucks a month, and we, I don't know, we had about five, ten times the speed. So um, that's an easy way to save money and actually improve your network um, speed there. Uh, any questions? Okay. Um, <clears throat> drive vaccine. Um, this is a, um, a nice little program wherein um, if you have uh, patron PCs that are out there for the public to use, um, being a, a network guy, you'll find that uh, a lot of people will have their computers and you have no idea what, the, what each person is going to use. The whole advantage of, of having PCs out for, um, for the public is that you want them to be up as much as possible, but you want the patron to have some, some, some control. Um, Drive Vaccine essentially is a program that uh, um, every single time somebody logs off, it restarts the PC and it formats the hard drive and it reinstalls everything in, in, a, in a very short period of time, um, wherein it's just like the day you set it up. Um, you have a, what's called a baseline on it. You set it up. Um, do a baseline, and then run the thing. And each person thinks that they have full control. Um, I actually had a little kid come in one of these one day, and, um, you know, he's a kind of a little computer kid, and um, he, he was kind of surprised that we didn't have protection on, on some of our Jobs and Career Center computers. Um, and he thought he could go in there and mess it up, um, go into the operating system and the control panel and things like that. And, and, and he thought, you know, I told him, go ahead, mess it up, do it the best that you can. He thought he completely destroyed it. He logged off, it reset, and everything was like the, the second that uh, he logged on in the first place. So drive vaccine is um, fairly inexpensive, and it's a great way for uptime on your computers. It'll make it so people just can't go in there and change your registry, do things like that that'll bugger up your computer. Um, it's just it's a great resource for, for keeping your computers from not being down and having to be re reinstalled. Any questions? Okay. Um, Microsoft IT Academy, I think uh, um, since this is Washington, most of you are, are familiar with it. Um, Microsoft IT Academy has some, some great resources. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it um, because most of you are familiar with it, but uh, um, big advantages are that, uh, um, you know, it's free. That's, that's a huge thing for, for my library. Um, it also offers... Um, uh, um, if anybody knows what a COA is, um, they offer um, programs. You can uh, download uh, um, versions of Microsoft Office um, and use those for your library for, um, for training purposes. 
um, which uh, is something that we took advantage of so that, you know, on some of our computers we had Office 2007, we were able to upgrade to Office 2013 um, for this particular purpose. Um, so um, that's a great way to save money without having to, you know, to buy the keys for the programs. Also, um, it's great for the staff. Um, a lot of libraries don't realize um, that you can, uh, um, let's see, Bill. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to keep up on the, the, the post there. Um, um, another thing, um, uh, a lot of the staff can actually um, take some of the tests for free, um, and a lot of libraries aren't aware of that. Uh, the big thing is, is time. Um, I think a lot of us find that we want to do it and just can't find the time to do, um, to do the program, take some of the courses. The nice thing is it's, it's self-based, so um, you can do it at home, you can do it at work. Um, it's just it's a great resource for um, expanding your education, and um, I think that uh, um, all of us could probably do a better job of advertising it to our public. Any questions about IT, Katamani? Okay. Yeah, we the, the, there are the vouchers. Um, and, and that's that's great for um, for the testing purposes. And these tests are are, are not cheap, so the vouchers are, are definitely well worth it. Okay, so um, another another um, thing that you can do is hard drive cloning. Um, here at my library, we have uh, uh, um, we have about twelve patron computers, and. Uh, um, we don't, we at our library, we don't have um, a domain, which many um, libraries do. Ours is just too small. It's not really worth the, the infrastructure to set up a domain. Um, so instead of going in and programming every single computer individually, um, you can use either a hard drive cloner, which is the picture on the right. Um, that's your, your little black thing. Um, or there are programs um, like down at the bottom, the macro and reflect, where you can actually um, clone a hard drive. Essentially, you have um, at the picture on the top left, you have a master, and then you have a master clone. Essentially, you're just taking. Um, you can create a, a build a computer and and install the operating system, get everything installed where you want it, and then you can clone that hard drive. So if you have identical computers, like for us, we have six standard patron computers. What we do is we we program one computer up, and then what I do is I remove the hard drive and put it in our hard drive cloner, and then all I do is I just clone it five times. For time-wise, it's, it's just much, much faster. It usually takes two or three hours. Um, there are definitely faster cloners. Um, um, for ours, it's, it's a little bit slower, but um, in about two or three hours, it's an identical clone of the hard drive. Now, the big thing to remember on these things, it has to be identical hardware. Ours, our Patreon computers, they all have the same size hard drive. They all have um, the same computer infrastructure. So um, it has to be the same exact unit. You can't have different computers to do this. Um, for those that are in IT, you know that you can't take a hard drive from one computer and put it in a totally different kind of computer and have it work. You'll get what's called uh, BSD, which is a blue screen of death, and uh, um, you, you won't like the outcome. So it needs to be the same hardware, but you'll find that a lot of libraries have the same exact computers. Now, it doesn't matter if it's um, if it's different, uh, different amount of RAM or what have you. Um, the big things are it's the same motherboard, um, the main component on there, and then it also has to be a similar hard drive size. Now, if you're doing these things and you have, say, one computer has, uh, for example, a 160 gig hard drive, um, and then your other computers have a 250 gig or a 500 gig hard drive, um, you cannot clone with these machines a 500 gig hard drive down to a 160 gig hard drive. So what you want to do, so say if you have um, different hard drives but the rest of the hardware is the same, what you want to do is create your setup on the smallest hard drive that you have. So say your small, smallest is 160 gig, you would do everything on that one first and then you would clone the other ones. You can always clone onto a bigger hard drive, you just can't clone onto a smaller hard drive. Now that's, that's for the machines. Um, for, uh, um, for using the software, there are programs like Macro and Reflect, um, uh, Acronis True Image is another one, wherein you can actually, um, uh, through their through their software, you can clone a smaller hard or a larger hard drive onto a smaller one. Um, 
I would still suggest that you do the um, smaller hard drive first because it's just much, much easier. Any questions about hard drive cloning? Okay. Uh, yeah, it must be. Um, the, the big thing is, um, uh, if you understand what a motherboard, that's the, the main board that everything is plugged into inside the computer. Um, that has to be the same. So if you have a computer, say you can have um, two computers that have the same exact processor, the same amount of RAM, same hard drive, but if the main board with everything plugged into is different, that won't work. So say you have, um, you know, for example, you have um, six Dell D something computers there. If they're the same exact model number, this should work just fine. But if you have one that's like a Dell D530 and then the other one's like a Dell D540, the motherboard is usually different. And that's, that's the main component on there. That's what everything plugs into. If that's the case, this won't work. It's only if you have exact computer, same motherboard. Um, and uh, um, it's easy to find out. You can, um, you can fire up your computer. It'll usually tell you um, some information about it. Um, um, usually, most uh, libraries aren't uh, building their own computers. They're, they're purchasing them from, be it Dell or some other company, and you can just look at the outside model number, and it should be, um, should be pretty clear on it that way. Does that clarify for you? Okay. All right, moving on. Um, Microsoft Steady State. Um, this is a program that, uh, again, we use here in my library. Um, this, this program was actually not designed for Windows 7. Um, uh, just a little information, all of, um, all of the computers in my library were running Windows 7. Um, uh, Windows 8 is not, uh, um, not everybody's favorite. Um, so we run Windows 7, um, but um, there is one caveat on this program. You cannot run a 64-bit operating system for this program. Um, it has to be Windows 7, um, Windows XP, or Windows Vista, and it has to be 32-bit. Um, if you're not sure what 32-bit and 64-bit are, um, the big difference between um, having a 64-bit and a 32-bit operating system is if you have a 32-bit operating system, the, uh, the, the most RAM that you can run, that's your, um, that's your memory, the most memory that you can have is up to 4 gigabytes of memory. If your computer has more than four gigabytes of memory, you want to run a 64-bit operating system because you can run considerably more up to, I, I, it depends on the motherboard, but um, well, over, well over four gigs of RAM. So um, this is one of those things, if you've got really nice newer computers, this program might not be um, good for you because your computer's only going to recognize four gigs of your RAM. Now, um, a lot of patron computers don't, they, for us, we're just using what's called nettop PCs. Um, they're little small um, computers um, that use very little power, and uh, um, uh, they don't have very powerful processors. So they're not specifically super fast, um, but the advantage is for us, they don't take up very much space, they weren't terribly expensive, and uh, um, we don't have to put uh, a 64-bit operating system on it because they've only got like two or four gigs of RAM. The advantage of doing this Microsoft steady state is you have controls. You can lock down your computers. So for our patron computers, we have this program running. Um, what you do is you install your computer, do everything like normal, and then you install, um, once you get your computer where you want it, you install Microsoft steady state. Um, then um, you get a, um, a program that comes up, and you get to set up what options you want the user to be able to use. The advantage of this is you can block out things like control panel. Um, you can block out things like printing if you want. Um, you can make it um, as locked down as you want. So people can't go in there and alter things. Um, it's great for, for patron PCs because you can just go in, um, set it up, and um, the patron can only do what you allow. So on ours, we allow for printing. We allow for Microsoft Office use and we allow for internet access. Um, we don't allow the patron to have any access to the C drive, so um, if they want to save something, they have to use a flash drive to save something, and we put that on our machines. The advantage of doing this is patrons can't go in there and screw up our computers, and like I was talking about earlier for the drive vaccine, it's a way to keep our computers up and running more. 
Um, uh, every library only has a finite amount of computers, and um, more and more it's harder to keep um, enough computers for people that want to use them. So um, for us, this is a big downtime. Um, another advantage of this program, it's free. Um, my favorite favorite price is free. Um, it costs nothing. All you got to do is just download it. Um, but again, if you're going to run it, make sure you have to run it on XP, Vista, or Windows 7. Um, I would suggest not running on XP because there's no longer any support for XP. Um, I probably wouldn't do it on Vista either. So um, just make sure if you're doing it on Windows 7, you have to have a 32-bit operating system because the program will not even install on a 64-bit. Um, that's a good question. Is this an alternative to drive vaccine? Um, it, it, drive vaccine is, is, is a totally different thing. Um, we, we have, uh, um, we have um, what's called patron computers in our, in our library, and then we also have a jobs and career center. Um, our patron computers are just for your basic surfing the internet, um, you know, typing something up on Word. We keep it really simple. We don't give them a whole lot of options to, to, to mess up the computers. Now, our, our jobs and career center um, computers, we, we want people to be able to do resumes. Um, quite often, people have to do tests and things like that. So we want our jobs and career center computers to be much more versatile and open for people. Um, sometimes you'll find out that uh, um, um, for certain applications, you can only run it on um, a certain browser, be it on Chrome or Firefox, where it doesn't work so well on Internet Explorer, which is the default for most computers. So on our Jobs and Career Center, we use the, um, the, the drive vaccine program. Um, on all of our other patron computers, um, and also the, the drive vaccine program you have to pay for. So um, a way of saving money for us also was to just, um, just buy the drive vaccine for the computers that we needed for our Jobs and Career Center. We have three of those. And then for the other nine Patriot computers we have in our library, I use Microsoft Steady State um, because it's free and it works quite well um, to keep people from doing stuff we don't want them to. The nice thing is you can go in there, you can uh, you can make it like I said so that they can't print if you don't want to. Um, you you can make so they couldn't even have internet access if you didn't want to there. So you have a lot of control. Um, it also sets up a um, a password and things like that. In the um, in the the small event that um, somehow the uh, the program gets uh, um, messed up, it's very easy to um, reinstall um, the program. Um, you can just delete the the account um, and then reinstall Steady State again, fresh and clean, and make it really quite easy. So. Um, it's, this is kind of a, a program that I don't know if there's Windows 8 support. We're not utilizing that at this moment. Um, but it's one of those things, if you're running Windows 7, um, it's, it's a great free program that we utilize. Um, is Drive Vaccine like Deep Freeze? Um, I think that it is. I haven't used uh, Deep Freeze myself. Um, but I believe it's kind of the same idea. Essentially, it's <clears throat> what it does is it's, uh, um, it protects your, your main hard drive partition, your main C drive, so that people can't mess that up. And essentially what it does, you have, like I said before, you have a baseline where you install the program and, um, and then you create a baseline, which is like its own little partition. And um, every time you log off or restart your computer, it goes back to that little partition and takes it to exactly where you had it. <clears throat> the nice thing is you can go in afterwards and do things like critical updates or install other programs and then you update the baseline and then you, you uh, um, so it's, it's not just a one-time baseline thing. You can update it weekly, daily, whenever you want and that way you have a computer that the people think that they can do whatever they want, so they have the control to, you know, do an application, run a, run a test, do whatever, um, but then um, their stuff isn't saved for the next person, so they can't see, you know, be it uh, um, any information okay, from, like, a resume or anything like that. there was one question that, uh, that uh, was asked that was just above Christians, and that's, can it be used on a Chromebook? It is, <clears throat> to my knowledge, um, I don't believe so. Um, I, I haven't tried using it on um, Chrome. Um, all of our PCs in our library, and that, that's a great question, um, all of the um, computers in our library are, are Windows-based. We have Windows 7 on every single computer in our library. Um, I don't know if there's um, uh, uh, Google Chrome support, and I don't know if there's um, Apple support. I believe that there is Apple, um, but I couldn't tell you offhand for sure. 
Um, um, but that, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, everything, like I said, that I'm going to be going over today um, for computers is going to be Windows-based. Okay, any other questions on Microsoft Steady State? Um, and you can just, uh, um, if you want to download it, you can just Google Microsoft Steady State um, and, um, and download it for free. Um, again, it won't say that there's Windows 7 support, but uh, um, if you do run Windows, um, Windows 7, um, there's uh, one thing that you got to do. Um, you, you download it, and then um, before you run the program, you actually have to right-click on it um, and then change the compatibility um, so that it's not for XP. Um, there's an option. Um, if you have any further questions, um, I'm going to type in my um, email address. Feel free to, um, to email me any questions that you have. Um, and um, I'd be glad to uh, um, either, you know, find you a download link or answer some questions on the installation. Um, I, I'm very familiar with this stuff. It's just hard to talk about a lot of the um, install particulars um, on this uh, um, time frame. But uh, um, feel free to ask any questions, um, and uh, I will do my best to get back to you on those. Um, any other questions about City State? I don't have a question about steady state, but I do want to point out for folks, uh, there's a lot of content being presented here already. I just want to remind you that we will have an archive up later on today. So if you need a refresher on any of this, it will be on our website. Thanks, Jeremy. Sorry, Travis. Go right ahead. No, that's that's great there, and and like I said, this is the um, uh, this is the first one I've I've done of these there. So if it's not perfect, I apologize. Um, but uh, we're we're trying to make it work here, so. Um, I don't know the, the website off of it uh, offhand. Um, if it's me, I would just uh, just Google Microsoft Steady State. Um, and um, if you can't find it, um, uh, let me know. And uh, if need be, I could, uh, um, I could set up a, a, a Dropbox um, and put it in. So um, um, if you have any questions on stuff like this, feel free to, to email me um, afterwards, and I'd be glad to help in any way I can. Okay. Um, this is a pro um, right here. Um, probably most of you have never heard of MDisk. Um, this is something that I, I think that uh, um, they should uh, pay me to advertise because I've never heard anybody bring this up except for me. Um, MDisk. Um, every library has data that they need to back up. Um, most people don't realize, um, if you look at the uh, um, down, um, down the bottom left corner, it says, how long will your files last? Um, it's kind of hard to see. It's a little bit small. Um, but uh, you'll see a little hard drive in the bottom of the left corner, and it says up to five years. Then you'll see a DVD right next to it says up to seven years. Um, then you get a flash drive up to eight years. And then you'll see a little MDIS thing, and it says up to 1,000 years. Every library has to back up data. Um, every business has to back up data, be it uh, um, tape backup, be it uh, external hard drive, um, be it cloud storage. Um, most people don't realize that data does not last on hard drives, DVDs, and flash drives. Um, over time, it will degrade because they're either storing, uh, uh, they either store them on um, hard drives and flash drives, which uses magnetic technology, or they store them on a DVD, which actually uses ink um, to store the data. Over time, um, your, your magnetic de technology will not, um, will not retain its strength, and you'll lose data. Um, over time, DVDs, the ink will fade, and you'll lose your data. MDisk is a fairly new technology. I think it's, I don't know, maybe three or four years old, if that, um, wherein it, um, you store this, um, if you look on the top right, you'll see an M disk right there, um, and then behind it is an M disk drive. Um, the M disk um, actually etches the information onto the disk. Um, if you look at the picture, it'll show um, your standard DVD, and then um, it shows, um, you know, your, uh, your uh, oh, what do they call it? polycarbonate la layer. Um, on the M disk, it actually, um, it, the disk is, it looks almost identical, um, but the big advantage, instead of using ink to store the information, it actually etches the information onto a disk. Um, the advantage of that is, as long as you don't scratch or break the disk or melt it or anything crazy, that data will last until you're long dead and gone. 
Um, a thousand years is the estimated. Um, this has been military tested. It's the only permanent backup that I've ever heard of. Um, the, the, the next best thing to do with stuff like this, and it's, it's not nearly as good as cloud storage. Um, cloud storage, the advantage is, um, if anybody doesn't know what cloud is, cloud computing is essentially storing your information on somebody else's server offsite. Um, the disadvantage of that is quite often you have to pay for that, and if that computer, if that company goes belly up or, or has a major error or issue there, you can lose your data. This program, all you got to do is buy the drive. Um, they sell drives. There are two different formats of disks. There's um, your standard DVD, and they also, um, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to read here. Uh, sounds like a record magnets um, will not mess with it. Um, yeah, this it's it's it doesn't have grooves. You're not going to be able to feel the um, the data on it like a record. Um, it actually it's inside the substrate, the the plastic covering, so you can't feel it. But it is kind of like like you said, like a record in the fact that it's actually physically on there. It's not ink that can fade over time. This uh, data was tested by the military. Now. Nobody can test it for a thousand years and, and assure that, but uh, that's their estimates on there. Um, and if it lasts for 30 years, I think all of us would be more than happy on it. Um, the the drives on the things, you can purchase um, drives for it, either a, um, a DVD drive or a Blu-ray drive. Um, a standard disk for, um, for your uh, DVD um, is 4.7 gigabytes of data. Um, and then um, they have two different kinds of Blu-ray discs. Um, they only have one out right now. It's a 25 gig storage. Um, but uh, um, pretty soon they're releasing a um, 100 gig storage disc on the thing. So um, for infrastructure purposes, it's not too much money to get started. <clears throat> Again, on Newegg, quite often you can buy an external DVD drive on these things, which would be just a USB um, DVD burner for as little as $20. And, and the discs um, for the DVD are usually um, anywhere from 2 to $4 per disc, um, which is definitely a lot more money than a regular disc, but you figure a disc that's the last for your entire lifetime, $4 is ridiculously cheap. Um, so um, they also have the DVD drives wherein um, you can buy either an internal or an external. And uh, um, the, uh, the external drive for a Blu-ray burner <coughs> is usually somewhere around $80 to $100. Um, the only company that I know of that actually um, that manufactures and, and sells these is uh, um, LG, um, again, you can buy these off of Newegg. That's where I bought uh, both of my drives. Um, the nice thing is, once you create one of these discs, be it a DVD or a Blu-ray, they can be played on any DVD or Blu-ray drive. So if you um, make a copy of it, you can take it in your regular, um, if you make a DVD copy, you can um, play it in any DVD drive. Um, if it's a Blu-ray, it has to be a Blu-ray drive player there. Um, but uh, there is no other way to truly permanently back up your data. Um, and, and to me, that's, that's, that's worth, worth its weight in gold. And again, you can get, um, as a library, you can get started for well under 100 bucks and do a true backup of all your data um, and then put them in a safe, like a fireproof safe or something, and, and have your, your information permanently stored. So um, I highly suggest this if you want to back up your data. Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to carry on here. Um, here is the. Oh, sorry. Does this include pictures? Um, yeah, you can. Um, you can. Uh, um, you can um, do pictures. Any kind of data. So. Um, uh, yeah, um, you could you could do pictures, any kind of data. So um, these discs could even be played um, if it's a movie. It could even be played like in a regular DVD player. It doesn't have to be computer. Um, I'm not going to um, suggest that you go copy all your movie collection and do this because that's uh, um, copyrighted for materials. But uh, um, yeah, it can do any format there. Um, and the nice thing is, like I said, you only have to have the specific drive to to create the data. Then you can play it on any normal drive there. So um, it's it's a great resource and um, it's not terribly inexpensive when you figure that you can truly back up your data permanently. 
Um, okay, um, carrying forward, um, library information monitors. This is something that we did. Um, here's a couple of pictures of our monitors here in my library, um, wherein um, for, for not terribly much money, I think um, we, we have three monitors that we just put the end of, um, of our shelves. Um, I think we were into it for about 600 bucks. Uh, that's figuring a monitor, um, basic computers, um, and then uh, the infrastructure for getting them going there. Um, I think our computers are running XP, which for this purpose really doesn't matter because they're not online. Um, the nice thing about these things, all you need is um, um, a monitor, um, a computer, and it doesn't have to be anything special. These are quite old and slow um, computers, a small one, because we've got just, just sitting on top of our shelves, um, and then just use uh, PowerPoint. And what we do is each month we create a PowerPoint presentation um, that's got all of our library information on it. And uh, um, the nice thing is you can put like all your library events, or sometimes we'll put our city hall events on there, um, and it's a great easy way um, to, to advertise things instead of every month printing tons of flyers and things like that off. Um, for us, um, we have three of them. So we have um, one for like main library information. We have one for our, our kids section and another one for um, like upcoming events there. So um, for not too much money, um, you can set them up. Um, there's other ways that you could even go cheaper. Um, they have uh, um, little uh, like the Chrome um, running um, Google machines that you could even do less. Um, now they can't, uh, they can't use Microsoft Office. But the advantage with them is all you got to do is you can create a Microsoft PowerPoint presentation, and then you can convert all the slides into pictures, and then you can just run the, um, the, the picture um, program um, slideshow through and do the same exact thing. It just wouldn't have the graphics that we use on there. So um, for not terribly too much money, um, you can have nice information, um, <clears throat> excuse me, banners that look fairly professional. All right, any other questions on that? Okay. Um, disk resurfacing. Sorry about that. Yes, um, the computer is on the shelf. Um, it's just on our top shelf. We don't have any books on our top shelf, so the space is um, available. Um, the computers that we got um, were uh, um, were not terribly expensive. They were just, uh, um, we have one of those local places that um, offers used machines, so we just got the smallest, cheapest computers that we could. Um, and we just leave them on. Um, we just leave them on 24-7, and then each night we just turn off the monitors. Um, so uh, all you got to do is when, when we get to work each day, we just fire up the monitors, and the presentation's going nonstop. And you just have it on a loop, and um, it's quite simple, and it works pretty well for us. And again, we were into it for less than $600, so um, for what we're getting and saving the prints and things like that, um, it's, it's benefited us quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> this is another thing that's um, true to my heart. Um, uh, yes, I love Easy Pro 2, and this this right here um, of anything that I told you, if you if you take one thing out of uh, out of my presentation, this would probably be it, just because it saves libraries tons of money. Um, I did the same presentation this past <coughs> um, uh, um, August at um, at the Whale Conference, and I was surprised to hear that a lot of libraries, when um, they have scratched discs, they just throw them away and buy new ones. And to me, that's such a waste of money. Um, this is, um, like they said, this is an Easy Pro um, disk resurfacer. It's a, a JFJ um, is the company. You can buy these machines. I think we got ours from Walmart for like $140. And this right here is the best purchase I ever made. Um, essentially, all it is is um, it's just a disk re resurfacer. Um, what it does is it has a, um, a, a foam disk on there that you put this white um, uh, wax on there, and it resources the disk. You can see up top left, there's your scratch disk. Afterwards, um, if you do it right, the discs look like they're brand new. And um, um, for a lot of things like nowadays for Blu-rays, when you're spending almost $30 for a Blu-ray or uh, most DVDs are $15 plus, um, resurfacing for cost-wise is pennies, um, and uh, um, the, the money that you can save is immeasurable. Um, cool thing about these things, this will resurface um, DVDs, Blu-rays, um, and CDs, and uh, um, even video games. Uh, da, 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 recommend, uh, yeah. Um, um, 
sorry, I'm just reading the information here. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Buy buy the buy the stuff in, in bulk is definitely a, a better way to do it. Um, essentially, um, it, it's it's not the greatest picture for size wise. Um, you'll see on the picture, you'll see the machine, and you'll see two little white uh, um, um, white buffing pads, um, and then um, down on the table you'll see a, a white and a blue material. Um, to be honest with you, I've never used the blue um, buffing solution on this thing, um, so that's another way to save money. The um, the material is is not terribly cheap. The uh, the um, the resurfacing material. So um, my suggestion is don't even bother with the blue. Um, the white stuff will do quite well. Buy it in bulk, like they said. You can buy. Um, it comes when you buy the machine. You get uh, the white material uh, uh, and. Uh, um, and you can um, buy it in like a bulk um, bulk container. That's what we do. Um, the only thing that we've purchased on the thing since I bought it is the pads. Um, you'll go through the pads um, once for us, once every couple of months or so, and then um, the uh, the white uh, polishing material. That's all we we've bought on the thing, and I've resurfaced hundreds and hundreds of discs. And the money that it saved, it's paid for itself tenfold um, in in just a short period of time. So. Um, it's it's a great machine. Every library should have one because it pays for itself in the first year, guaranteed. Um, yeah, um, yeah. As a community service, there um, there are places that do it. Um, I've even heard about places. Um, um, I've seen locally where places will charge like four dollars to resurface a disc or anything. Um, here at my library, we um, we don't uh, we can't charge for things like that. Um, but I have had people come in, um, and um, I just said, you know, hey, if you're happy with it, um, buy some things from our li friends of the library for donation purposes there. So um, that's a great way to uh, to save money and. Um, it's it's not difficult to use. It takes maybe ten minutes to get um, to get comfortable with it. There's videos online, um, and uh, um, you will surely thank me for uh, purchasing one of those things. Um, do yeah. you? Uh, they apparently supply the claws for wiping. Do you use those, or do you buy alternative ones? Well, um, they offer um, in the thing. They um, they have some white uh, um, like microfiber. They're kind of like. Uh, um, uh, uh, Paper towels, except for they're uh, um, they don't pull apart and they don't leave particles. Um, we actually use that, and then um, after that, we also use a, a microfiber like disc cleaning cloth um, just to clean up any extra. And um, you can buy them again. You can buy a lot of this stuff on Amazon. Um, it's not terribly expensive. Um, if you're going to buy the thing, the, the things I would buy um, to go with it is I'd buy more of the, the white pad, um, that's the surfacing disc, um, and then uh, buy more of the white polish. Now, um, in this you'll also find, which may seem weird to some people, um, you'll find um, sandpaper. They have sandpaper discs. If you get a disc that's really, really scratched, um, uh, most discs just have, you know, just basic surface scratches, um, but if you get a disc that's really scratched, um, you can actually use the sanding disc in these things to, um, to completely buff down the surface um, and get past the scratches and then you can surface it there. So um, these things can, can fix even really, really deep scratched items. Um, the deeper the scratch, the longer it's going to take you and you have to use the sanding discs, um, but uh, um, that is included. We, we rarely ever have to do those. Most of them are just surface scratches. Um, the things that this will not fix is um, if the disc is cracked um, or if uh, um, um, some, um, we find this on um, some of the uh, books on CD that you get. Um, if you flip the disc over the top, they have the little um, kind of reflective um, material on there. If that flakes off, that's where the data is actually stored. Um, can't fix that. This only fixes scratches on the disc there. So um, it, it, it doesn't work complete miracles, but the rest is is um, is well worth it. And um, if you have any questions on there, again, um, I posted my email address and um, uh, feel free to contact me there. But um, I guarantee you'll you'll appreciate buying this machine. One other quick question: How do you know sure. which pad to use? Um, for us, um, we, well, the the uh, there's only two pads that you use. You you have a pad that's black um, that you adhere the uh, um, the sanding pad to, 
um, and then the other pad is white. 99.9% um, .9 of the time we just use the white pad because they're just basic. So if your disk is really deep scratched, that's where you have to use the different one, but 99% of the time it's just, it's just surface scratches from everyday use, and that's where you're just going to use the regular machine. Um, the machine has um, four settings on it. Um, it has, uh, I believe, a 10 second, um, a 20 second, um, a one minute and a two minute setting there. Um, and essentially you just put the thing on there, um, uh, put the disc, lock it in place, uh, put some of the, uh, the polish on there, lock it down, and then hit the button that you want, and it'll automatically spin it up, and then it'll turn itself off there. And then you remove it, you're going to clear off the material, and then wipe it clean, and, uh, um, and on most of them, it looks like a brand new disc. And again, um, it comes with a blue polishing material, which is your secondary. If you want to make the thing look like brand spanking new, you can use that. Um, to do that, though, you, um, they suggest that you switch the, the buffer pads. For us, it's just not worth it. The white buffing material works phenomenal by itself. I've never used the blue. That way, we don't have to swap it and take the extra time. So, um, but uh, feel free to try that if you like. But uh, and there are um, there's videos like YouTube videos and everything online to make it really quite easy to do that. So, um, and again, if there's anything on here that I've gone over that you need some clarification or want some extra help on, please feel free to email me. Um, I'll type my email address again in case you missed it. And uh, um, and uh, uh, was there any other questions? Uh, how many times can you possibly sand this? You can do it over and over and over again. Um, now, if your disc is like heavily scratched and you have to sand it, you're actually taking some of that substrate material off of it, so um, the disc will actually be thinner. So there comes a point to where, you know, you, there's only so much material. But um, doing the buffing, you're actually adding material, actually adding the polish to it. So you can do it over and over and over again to it. Oh, thank you for typing my email address there, saving the effort. But uh, um, that is my presentation. Um, are there any other questions before we call it to conclusion? Well, Travis, I think the fact that 35 people said that this was worth their time and talent and showed up and, and uh, took a listen to you shows that this is something that libraries really appreciate. So we thank you very much for being willing to ch switch your presentation from um, you know, an in-person to an online. Uh, we really appreciated it, and I know lots of folks across the country did as well. So um, let's just see, as I see, Anne is applauding, and the first few minutes the slideshow will be available, and Jeremy generally has that up by noon today. So, um, and if you go back to the first Tuesday's webpage, which um, is that, you will be able to um, access it there. So any other last, here comes, you know, there, there's the, the um, <laughs> the gal from Australia said it was worth waking up that early. Thank you. We appreciate that. That's a real vote of confidence, uh, Travis. <laughs> so thanks again. Any other last questions? After, do I see anybody typing? We can kind of do it. Uh, let's see here. Anything else? Well, I think that was a very practical, very hands-on, um, gave us confidence to tackle some things we might not have done. Good. And people are, of course, bailing, it looks like, because lots of folks have to be on the desk at 10. So we thank you again, Travis, and uh, thanks for sharing your expertise with us. All right. Thank you, everybody.